Hey everyone, this is Decryptolorian from the Well community and welcome to another episode of Artex Well. Uh, today I am so excited and to have an extremely talented guest. Uh, he is a landscape photographer, an NFT photographer, and also a doctor. <laughs> His name is Jose Ramos. Uh, Jose's images have been published in several uh, places, in, including National Geographic, uh, international photography ma magazines, and he also it works as a physician specializing in, in psychiatry. Man, Jose, welcome to the show. You're you're a busy Hi man. There. <laughs> yeah, welcome, welcome. How are you? I'm fine, but a little bit nervous. This is a great moment for me. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation. First of all, it's a huge pleasure to be speaking to the Well community. And I, I remember the crypto telling me that this is, was going to be uh, quite a chilling moment, just a casual chat. And all of a sudden, I knew that Will Sharp would be present too. And then I got <laughs> extremely nervous, but I'm trying to keep it cool. Uh, psychiatrists also get anxious, unlike most people think. So most of all, I would like to thank you guys for the opportunity. I feel extremely honored by this. And the whole whale team has been amazing since the beginning, from the invitation to the image choice process. And I need to thank you, the crypto, for being so cool. And it's a pleasure to to be here. Hope this is a good time for everyone. Oh man, it, it, the the pleasure is always ours, uh, Jose. It, it has been wonderful to uh, to have you, and to uh, to see your work and explore your work. And for, for those of you who don't know Jose, uh, tell us your story a little bit about, uh, you know, who, who are you? Who's Jose? Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I'm going to try to keep it short because I have a lot to tell. And my career already has 18 years. It has been parallel to my career in psychiatry and medicine. So I don't want to bother you guys with a huge monologue. I'm going to seize the opportunity because I've then some presentations at some conferences. And so I'm going to share my screen and use some slides, which will help me in guiding you through, through this trip. Let me just, okay. So the crypto, can you see my screen right now? I can. Okay, perfect. So let me just go to the beginning. Well, um, just like I was telling you guys, I don't know if you can see this properly. I guess so. Just like the crypto was saying, I'm a landscape photographer. I'm also a psychiatrist. Uh, it's not easy to, to join both careers. They are both full-time right now. So I, I could say that sometimes people ask me how I would choose between one or the other. And the reality is that I would not be able to choose because I, I think they complement each other. Uh, regarding photography, I've been shooting for 18 years. I just made 40 years past Monday. It was my birth my birthday. I don't feel like 40 years on the inside. I still feel like <laughs> something like 25, but well, it's 40. I try to believe that 40 is the new 30s, uh, but I've been shooting for, for a long time. I've done image licensing, publication in magazines, just like the crypto was saying. I've collaborated with brands and entities. I've done photo tours, mostly in my beautiful Portugal. Uh, and I have obviously started in an NFT space. I mostly focus on landscape and nature of photography. I love long exposure imaging, and I'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. Well, about my trips, I've done a lot of trips besides my beautiful country, Portugal. I know that Will Shark already knew it, fortunately, not only just the mainland, but also Madeira, which is beautiful. Um, I found a second home called Iceland, and I visited it quite often. Most of my portfolio is from Portugal and Iceland. I decided to focus on these specific places. I also went to other places like the Italian Alps, Spain, the Lavender Fields, and many other. Um, well, just like I was telling you, besides the NFTs, this new world of NFTs, I've done print sales, I've had the publications in magazines, the collaboration with brands. And it's uh, it's interesting because brands seem to not have arrived yet to the NFT space in terms of supporting photographers. Mm -hmm. uh, but before this, it was quite important to, 
well to establish meaningful relationships with brands and get some new gear, some prototypes and, and test. And I also did some experiences with smartphone brands. I had the pleasure of showing the landscapes of Portugal. These are two seascapes in Portugal, very well known. And they were used for the world launch of some smartphones. Oh, and this man. was all captured with the smartphones. Quite a challenge I was used to my my dearest camera, my filters, my tripods, but it all came, I think, good. It was an, a very exciting experience. And then recently, probably the most intense experience, which happened in 2019, which was the Net Geo Conference. Uh, Joan Lolos, the backpacker, also quite well known in the NFT space, has also been on this conference uh, this year. And it was nerve wracking but the audience was incredible. I had the chance to share the stage with people like Daniel Berhevelak, who is a Pulitzer photographer, and Franz Lanting, which is an incredible nature photographer. Well, beyond all of these things, and you might be wondering, how is this guy a physician and he's doing all of this? I as well as say that I don't sleep too much, even though I should. <laughs> don't follow my, my advice. Jose, do... I was going to say, what yeah. haven't you done? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't hear you. I was going to say, what haven't you done? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I still think I have a lot to learn and a lot to do, but yeah, it's, a great it's mindset. quite a ride, quite a ride and quite a roller coaster. Then there's the conservation projects. I'm collaborating on, on a mission and more recently with Give Back to Nature through NFTs. It's one of the most fantastic things that nfts have brought me which was the possibility of establishing connections with collectors which is not easy for the traditional circuits in landscape photography and i've had the possibility of donating 10 percent of all my profits for give back to nature so this is a sum up of the part related with photography i don't want to convert this into a, a long monologue just like i told you because then I was going to mention how this all started and how psychiatry intersects with with photography. But let me know if you have any questions so so far. Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, so first off, congratulations on hitting forty. We are exactly the same age. So. Okay, <laughs> so we are feeling bucks. the same as me. The same existential reflection of what's going on. Uh, I'm probably younger than this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree with you 100%. I do uh, I do not feel 40, but uh, hey, 40 is, is the new 20, right? That's... <laughs> okay. I said the new 30, but uh, I see that you are going even longer than that. I like it. So right, new, right. Okay, we, I like it. We got to go big. Uh, but yeah, one of the questions I, I really wanted to ask you, Jose, is uh, what were what were you first? Were you a physician first or a photographer first? I'm just curious. That, that's a good question. And probably the slides that I have next are going to answer that because first I was a medicine student and only then I became a photographer. Now, I, I mentioned here that the beginning, it was based on upbringing, on my upbringing. I was born in the south of Portugal in a small town in Alentejo. It's a beautiful region of Portugal with extremely vast plains. They are well known for these sunflowers fields. And I've actually uh, put this image up for auction uh, one week ago for donating whole profits to Ukraine. And fortunately, fortunately got a bid yesterday and today it's going. Uh, the auction is still live, but this is my hometown. This is near my hometown. So I have always been extremely close to nature. And even though I was not connected with photography, none, no one in my family had connection to art. Uh, I always had this urge inside me to, to create, but I was not into photography. I was actually in a music band, a heavy metal band, when I was in my hometown. Okay. And that was the way I used to cha channel my, my, my creations and my, my, my desire to, to do something. Then... Just like you asked me, I went to, to, to med school. So all of a sudden, I'm leaving a small town, a calm town, when there were more than five cars on a line. I thought that would be a lot of traffic. And then all of a sudden, I go to Lisbon. And when I go to <laughs> Lisbon, 
well, it's not that big of a city, but it's big enough for me. And I got a little bit detached from nature. Uh, it used to be my, my space for silence, for, for contemplation, for reflection. But going to med school is an experience I w would not recommend to most people because it's kind of, it's like military operations, but for the mind. So it was absolutely nonstop studying. I did not know what was coming. And I, I wrote on this slide, the void of creation, because I had no time to play. I used to play guitar. I had no time to meet with my band friends. So... I had to give up on that idea. Then something happened, which was the arrival of digital photography. And this is my absolute first camera. It's a Pentax Op 2S. Uh, my parents bought it to me. I was still a student back then. And um, the thing is, why did I purchase this? Or did I, why did I ask my parents to buy this? I didn't want to create art. I just wanted to capture some images from gatherings, birthdays, all sorts of events. And it was just to capture these moments and keep them with me. And the thing is that there was no artistic purpose on this. Uh, back in that time, when I had the camera, I was in my second year of college. And I still participated in an online forum. To give you an idea, this was long before smartphones had proper cameras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's because we are 40. We are we still remember <laughs> when, when smartphones did not have cameras. Not and <laughs> yeah, we definitely do. And the thing is that this camera made me venture again into nature. So I was no longer just totally reading books, studying, stressed. I thought to myself, I have a camera, let's see some pretty places, let's take some pictures. And these pictures, I started creating them, but I just kept them on my hard drive. There was no purpose of, of sharing them at all. And then something happened. I was in an online forum long before social media, when people gathered in specific subject forums. It was a forum related with music, with rock and metal. And a friend of mine asked me, why did I share these images? And she told me that there was already a lot of online communities uh, to where people could share their images, their art. And that's when I first published my, my photo. It's this one. I'm not ashamed of showing it. Um, actually, I have my DeviantArt website opened. It's right here. These were my absolute first photos. I know that photographers don't like to show their worst photos. <laughs> Obviously, in my website, I have picked the best photos. But I like to keep this legacy. This was my nickname back then, Inebriantia. And this image with the lighthouse, it was my first ever published image. I just posted it, well, because this friend of mine asked me to do it. I had no specific purpose while doing it. But I was extremely surprised because... I started getting comments on this image and they were extremely positive. Then I went to see who are these people, what are they creating? And as soon as I knew I was totally addicted to photography, to the act of sharing photography, to think about it. And what's interesting is that for very long, since the beginning, this is probably in 2004, yeah, exactly wow. 18 years ago, I already like to, to write my long descriptions in my images. The people who know me know that I like to write quite a lot about them. And it's interesting because I did it right from the beginning because I always thought that images should also bring a little bit of ourselves. So these were my first images. Please don't visit this site. Please don't book <laughs> it. I just wanted to show you this example. And so this is how it all started. Any questions? No, that that's fantastic. That it, you went through all the questions I had for when you first started. Um, you know, one of them was was going to be about your. You know, it, was photography the first thing you dived into for artistic expression? And uh, like you said, heavy metal music. That is that's awesome. <laughs> okay, I don't I don't know if you identify with that with that musical sub-style or sub-genre, but well, I love it. I love a lot of music, but 
metal is in my heart for for long. Same for me. Same for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks like oh, yeah. extra yeah. points. Extra points for the whale community. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. fantastic. I mean, metal music is uh, definitely something that I love too. Uh, and and I I love that you're so you you started with music and then you kind of, uh, yeah. I we Rune and I both totally get uh, how hard it is to be a physician. Uh, we both work for a, uh, a hospital. Oh, um, so cool. Yeah, in, in the IT side of things. But we okay. do, you know, we do work with a lot of physicians and, uh, you know, and, and staff. And yeah, um, we see the the pains because <laughs> we work for a teaching hospital. So we we understand completely how crazy it can get for studying and it, it, it encompasses your life. So I'm glad that you took this time to to share this with us, but also um, I, I'm glad you took the time to jump into photography because, um, you know, even you sharing your first pieces, it's really um, inspiring because honestly, you have a really good eye for this stuff. I mean, from even from the start, look at this photo. I mean, you, you say don't look at it, but I say, <laughs> man, this is fantastic. And what's cool, what's great about it also is that it also shows the growth. I mean, I've seen your, your most recent stuff and <clears throat> I'll tell you, this is a really good picture. I like it. But um, but yeah, it's the growth aspect um, of seeing the older stuff compared to now has been wonderful. And seeing this makes me appreciate your work even more because of, you. you know, seeing where, how far you've come. I do have a quick question. And DC, if you don't mind, um, Whale Shark actually had a question for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wanted to, know, wanted to know what. Um, what would you say your um, your creative signature is when it comes to photography? Okay, that's an interesting question. And I, I will probably go towards my long exposure techniques, my working with light and composition. I don't know if I can say that my images have a specific aesthetic. Uh, I'll just put my website right here. Let me just put my portfolio. Probably waterscapes. These are beautiful, by the way. Yeah, you're long. Mo you're yeah, amazing. most most of all, I always try to use long exposures. Not yep. always. The thing is that long exposures they create serenity out yep. of chaos. You have extremely intense landscapes, like a waterfall in Iceland, which is completely blasting your ears with noise. Everything is quite epic around you. But yeah. then you do the long exposure, and you get some of the motion of the water and the sky and you get the detail in the sky and just looking at the screen right there it's kind of a magical process it's like the camera yeah. it's doing magic so if i would have to define my visual style i would go first of all i am not afraid to work with colors as you can see yeah. i know that instagram created a new trend of more desaturated images but, well, I've seen the most incredible landscapes in my life. When you search for the light, sometimes you see sunsets that you will immediately say, well, this, exactly. is, this looks like Photoshop. This is pure Photoshop in real life. This is God doing Photoshop with the sky. So I love to work with color. Obviously, some mm -hmm. people think it's just a question of sliding the saturation slider all the way to the right. No, it definitely is not. But it definitely <laughs> is not. It so, definitely is not. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so I love to work with color. I love to work with guiding lines. I like to have a distinct foreground to which the viewer connects. And most of all, have captivating compositions where things have their own space and that people can um, dive into, okay? Uh, I want the persons who watch the images at least feel something similar to what I felt. Obviously, they will give it their interpretations, Looking at some of my images, I think you can you can say that there's something specific regarding the work with light. So what I do really like is what you said. Your long exposure um, shots are amazing. And the story that they can tell could be totally different than um, someone else who doesn't go through that process. So that, that Aurora shot that you had with the waterfall, if you yeah. by any chance had to um, – uh, took that shot – um, at the normal f-stop, um, at, the, at the normal amount of shutter speed, you would get the jagged lines of the actual waterfall itself and probably not as much as the sky because of the amount of light that you're letting in. Yeah. But, um, but a, a result of that is a more chaotic, like you said, a more chaotic, aggressive type of image, whereas what you're doing right here 
is showing the showing the serenity, like you said, and also the the ethereal um, uh, uh, mindset of like of Mother Nature in itself, because you know we can see the the, the fine details of of a waterfall or water droplets or even uh, of the sky um, it, with our with our own eye, but seeing it still like this and knowing that there's still motion, it tells the story yeah. with that. Uh, it, it's such a difference. So I do appreciate that. Thank you. And just like you, you were telling me, the, the long exposure is really what I like to do because I, I, don't do, I don't do composite photography, I try to get it right on the field. I'm not against composites at all. I think it's a totally valid way of creating art. But it's the thrill of looking at the image uh, of something which is similar to the end product. So obviously, we need to post-process it. But the thrill of seeing it on location, it's incredible because it's so different from what you are actually seeing in front of your eyes. And this is also a valid way of watching reality because our eyes look at reality at 24 frames per second. This is a different version of reality, but it's also a valid version of reality, which really connects with the viewer when, when it looks at the images. So that's why I, I really love it. And thank you for the thing about the growth because that's why I keep this website open because there you go. I, I think it shows the progression and well I'm I'm not ashamed of the of my first you, images. Yeah, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't no. be we're part of the of this. Yeah. It shows again, like you said, you're always learning. Um, you always like to learn, which is a great trait in itself. But the simple fact that as you could see the growth over time, you could also appreciate how far you've come. So I, I, yeah. I love I love stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jose, we do have another question from uh, Wellshark for you. Okay. Since we we did touch on Instagram a bit, what is your what is your thoughts about the Instagram algorithm and the ability to be uh, dramatically curated by uh, or democratically curated? Excuse me by Web 2 versus being curated by Web 3? OK. Well, that's a great question. Thank you, Will Shark. Um, <laughs> I'm posting, I'm putting my Instagram right here. Well, I came, just like I was saying before, with my 40 years of wisdom. Uh, I, since we started long ago, I was in photography long before this algorithm battle. And we photographers that have been shooting for long a community like DeviantArt which I showed you where I had my first pictures it was extremely innocent there was the spirit of community which I'm feeling coming back in the NFT space which is quite interesting but we don't have we didn't have to to kind of struggle with some automated choice of how people are going to see how it works uh, what factors will influence people seeing our works? So um, I think the algorithm is important because social media became extremely popular. So if there wasn't an algorithm, it would be chaos all over. But people always ask for the good old chronological ordered Instagram because people used to see the pictures they wanted to see and there was nothing curating them. So. I'm still struggle to deal with the algorithm. I think that it's useful, but it should take something else more into account. And when we go to Web3, I think things are changing. Things are changing mostly because there's no disclosed relationship with collectors. There's this tight-knit community on Twitter, which is fascinating. I didn't use Twitter before I went into the NFT space. And I think things are changing for, for the better. So regarding Instagram, it created a lot of trends and I think they were useful. It's still a great place to share your images and reach as many people as possible. But probably that meaningful connection, that personal relationship I used to establish with people back then in the old communities, it's more non-personal. It's not as pleasant. Unfortunately, Twitter is bringing that back to us. Wow, that is a fantastic answer, Jose. Uh, and and I, I like the way that you said that. And I do agree with you uh, that it it is it is bringing the community back. And wow, what a great community that we have on 
uh, Twitter. And, you know, it's it's been a pleasure of mine to get to know everybody uh, in the photography community because, man, when we're doing these spaces, it's just absolutely um, mind blowing. It's fantastic. I love it. Uh, you know, I, I did have kind of a, a selfish question for you, but mm-hmm. also uh, somebody actually said the same thing as me. Uh, this is from Heather. Uh, so what is uh, what is the most because I, I noticed that a lot of your shots are in nature and I, I'm a huge fan of nature, lo- a big lover of nature myself. And I can't wait to go um, hiking in uh, Madeira at, at some point. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> so ha- so what is the most remote? inaccessible place that you photographer that you've took shots uh and that you felt the most satisfying and rewarding in the moment okay that that sounds a good question (laughs) i I will probably have to mention the icelandic islands because they're some of the most epic and intense places ever um i went to iceland several times probably i think i visited it seven or eight times if i'm not mistaken and usually people when they visit iceland for the first time they always go round the main road and see all the iconic spots but then you have the enigmatic islands right in the middle but the problem is that they are only accessible with a four wd four wheel drive vehicle so it's not as accessible as the other places the thing is that the islands they have their own magic they have um they are remote they are also beautiful there's a diversity of landscape which is absolutely unimaginable in such a short uh, island um and you can witness things like this this is a drone image i made in the central highlands of iceland it's called landman logger and this was a magical moment when snow had fallen in with extreme intensity it was actually quite difficult to reach here because when snow falls the usual four-wheel drive vehicles are no longer allowed to to enter the highlands and well being in a place like this it's you just feel absolutely disconnected from everything but at the same time you are connected to everything because you feel part of the world you are just a tiny dot but you are overwhelmed by everything that's around you and it's such an intense feeling so i I would say that the islands i've traveled often in the islands in in the past journeys i actually i think i have some behind the shots images where i show my dearest four-wheel drive camper which is this (laughs) one this is my faithful companion because when i go to iceland i need to be constantly mobile i want to follow along the weather and the light i don't like to have a predefined path to to go so i just add this amazing vehicle i did a collaboration with, with the vehicle brand i captured it under the northern lights and it allowed me to go to incredible places wow. like this. This is Kerlingarfjotl, which is also in the Icelandic islands. So imagine yourself being on a place like this, be it inside the camper, having dinner, on the outside shooting. There's no one else around you. And well, it's unforgettable. That's why I'm absolutely addicted to, to this place. Oh, man, Jose, uh, <laughs> you just gave me some wonderful ideas. <laughs> uh, and I Glad probably that. will be talking to my wife later on this evening because, okay. yeah, we we're getting we are getting that camper and we are going on a, on a trip for <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll give you I'll give you all the tips you need, because either we have a two wheel drive and we need to stay on the outside of the of the island. Yeah. If you want, if you want to go to the inside, you need a sturdy vehicle. So I do, I do want to take a question that I'm. I know DC was going to ask, but I'm going to take it because I want to. Um, Okay. No, so um, it's a whale shark question again. Also, is uh, you know, as a photography expert, who do you collect from your peers? Now, for me. I know that, like, I'm a fan of like old school um, photos, like Ans- uh, uh, photographers Ansel Adams uh, and Yusuf Karsh uh, for portraits. Um, but, but is there anyone in the space currently that um, that you like? Uh, you're a fan of, or you collect their um, photos, or is there anyone okay. like that? That, that? That's also a great question. Thank you. Well, 
that's interesting because I have a lot of friends that were photographers long before the NFT space. They are probably the old school crowd, I would say. And they have transitioned to the NFT space with great success. And I'm a huge fan of them. So I would definitely, definitely collect them. You can see, just like I mentioned, there are different trends in landscape photography. I was going to mention the, yes, the example of Albert Ross, which has already been interviewed by you guys. He's a big friend of mine. I knew Albert when he, when he was starting in photography, and then he suddenly developed into one of the world's best landscape photographers. So I would definitely think of names like Albert Ross. I would mention probably mm -hmm. Felix Inden, which is also in the NFT space. I would mention, obviously, Yuri Belagushki, which puts... Iceland in the map of the world landscape photography. Um, there are people like Vieri Botazzini, the fine art Italian photographer. And finally, there are plenty of names where I'd like to also mention Baber Afzal. Baber has an incredible portfolio and is a gentle and kind soul. And his generosity actually put me into the NFT space because he invited me into the NFT space. It was him who convinced me that I should try, give it a try. And I was, as you can see, totally addicted to it. <laughs> so yeah, there are some old school photographers I would naturally yeah. collect. And obviously, just like you told me, Ansel Adams, uh, probably Galen Rowell, which is a huge yep. inspiration in landscape photography for yes. me, Sebastian Salgado, naturally. And I was extremely surprised. I'm just going to use this opportunity because I'm a huge admirer of Paul Nicklin and Christina Mittermeier. They are the founders of Sea mm. Legacy. They are incredible conservationists. They have yeah. done a lot for the environment. And Paul Nicklin is, is going to mine his NFTs in a carbon neutral platform. And I was extremely si excited when I, when I saw this. So it looks like that. Most of the established artists are fortunately slowly transitioning to the NFT space. And I hope this trend continues. Oh, I hope so too, uh, Jose. I hope yeah. so too. And I'm sure Well Shark is writing down a bunch of those names right now to go check out <laughs> if he hasn't okay. already. I'll, I'll give you a list of names afterwards if you want to, no problem. <laughs> That's fantastic. My pleasure. Hey, I, I, I had, um, you know, while we're looking at your pieces, I kind of want to pivot a little bit. Um, to the piece that, uh, yeah, the standing am among the giants. Um, if we can go to that, yes. So yeah, I wanted okay. to look at this one for a second. But before we get into this, you know, kind of a selfish question again, uh, you know, going back to psychiatry a bit, your shots, like you said, you know, there's a lot going on, right? And um, yeah, ex exactly. You know, your, your shots are so peaceful. You know, you have your, your nature approach. But you said that, you know, I, I love this. You said that there's a lot of chaos that happens, um, but the, the shot you take is, uh, you know, is, is peaceful. You know, it's like you're connected to the earth. Do you bring that, uh, you know, psychiatry outlook, the, the training that you've had into your photography? Is that is that kind of the connection? You know, because hmm. I'm kind of getting that a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's extremely interesting. I would say that it was not conscious at the beginning because I love to do long exposure photography even before I entered this specialty of psychiatry. We usually have a six-year medicine graduation, then we have a professionalizing year where we go through all the departments and only then I chose psychiatry. So I already liked long exposures. I already liked the grand vistas, the epic landscapes, but probably just like I, I say here on these slides, psychiatry definitely strengthened my relation with photography. Um, and during my specialization, it's a five year specialty, uh, I was on my second year and a question came to my mind if it would be possible to join photography and psychiatry because I like to create, I like to transmit and write about my images. I was making this specialization. So is there a connection between these two? Why am I doing things this way? And then I found something extremely interesting which is called phototherapy. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know about it. I was in the day hospital training. It was a six months training on my second year of, in, of, of, of the specialty. And I thought about 
creating something that would merge both areas. And I found a fascinating field. It's called phototherapy. This is Judy Weiser. She's a Canadian psychologist. She's the world guru of this subject. And I was astounded to find out that there were tons of research made, not only about using photography for therapeutical value for the self, like if I go and shoot Iceland because I need to feel more relaxed, more inspired. Photography was also being used in formal psychotherapeutic context. So it was extremely interesting. I tried to connect with lots of therapists. They were all extremely enthusiastic because I thought about trying to set up a project like this on the, on the day hospital. Fortunately, the, the department accepted it. So I started a project there. Um, it had several modules and with this project, I discovered that there's a huge potential not only to improve our well-being, but also to improve the life of other persons using photography as a tool. So we did several things as interesting as I photographed them in the, in the day hospital. This is me right on the back. I'm hidden here in the background. I was photographing them. Then we explored the photos with the patients, exploring self-image, how they saw themselves, how they saw others, very interesting things. I also showed them a group of images to have their answers regarding those images to see which emotions they projected in those images. And the most interesting of it all was getting a bunch of digital cameras. And once again, this was quite a few years ago, there were digital cameras were kind of expensive, but I managed that my colleagues, they, they borrowed me probably something like eight cameras. We gave them to the patients so that the patients could take them home and take any photos that they wanted and bring us memorable moments of their lives, of their struggles, of their days, so that we could explore it in the day hospital. So it was extremely exciting. It was quite interesting. It showed me that photography has the power to, to it acts like some sort of catalyst of emotions. When people are looking at an image, they have some sort of direct access to their subconscious. And the photo is triggering something in them which might not be conscious, but it's felt. So it was a great help to explore some aspects of their lives and of their emotions. And what was even more incredible is that I had the chance to present this project. I met Judy Weiser, the, the Canadian psychologist, and all the other therapists, and I went to Finland to, to present it. So it was extremely interesting to do this. Taking back to your question, definitely. When I realized how powerful this was, I probably changed not only the way I capture images because I knew they had this immense power and potential, um, but I also knew that the memories that go along with them, the, the captions, the descriptions, the way we connect with others, they can be extremely therapeutic, they can be powerful. So that's why I, I actually, when I did this presentation, I, I thought about it because photography has a huge therapeutic value. It enhances creativity, relaxation, meditation. Well, what you were talking about, creating serenity out of chaos, probably it's the most interesting aspect of this uh, because I'm trying to bring some, I would say some peace, some well-being, some introspection to the people who view my images. They already have so, so much ugly stuff going on. So if they can dive into these images, I will be quite glad with it. Wow, Jose, uh, fantastic. That is that is so cool. I find that so fascinating. That is, uh, it's amazing that you're here sharing it with us, to be honest. Uh, that, uh, wow, I, I, that's all I could say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm so, I'm so happy that, uh, that I asked that because, um, yeah, it, it, I mean, what you said and everything and, um, and, and the presentation and the study, you know, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I'd love to see more of that, you know, um, and just again, selfishly myself, uh, but, uh, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure everyone else finds it just as fascinating. <laughs> I hope so. Um, but yeah, uh, I, so I, I kind of want to pivot a little bit and I know Rune is, uh, 
Rune, you want to ask a question? You could go ahead, and then we'll talk about uh, standing well, among giants. <laughs> well, no, well, yeah, okay, there's that. But um, no, actually, I did want to um, comment on the um, the phototherapy side of things because of the the setting up the shot, making sure everything is perfect to the way that you like, and even if it's not perfect, trying to get the eye to see the perfection and the imperfection. To me has always been super calming. I mean, especially with landscape photos. Um, I, I, I live, uh, DC and I both live in a, in a very, very picturesque state. Um, and so there's, there's a lot that we can, that we can do, but there's also beauty in uh, the, the chaos also, like you said, when it comes to, um, you know, an urban, uh, urban style photography, architecture, photography, or anything like that. The great part about photography, especially from a therapeutic standpoint, is the fact that it doesn't have to be tied down to the way that one person thinks or way that one person sees things. Because just like art, everyone sees art differently and should see art differently. So that is actually a very wonderful um, uh, thing that you that you wrote up there and that you were able to to bring into the practice, the um, the phototherapy side of things. That was that's awesome. I just had to comment that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had a feeling that you were you were ready to say that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you already have telepathy between yeah. your well, we also, we like also this. use like it for world. yeah, because like 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 DC said, we work in a we work in a hospital. It's it's crazy, and you know the 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 photography side of of, of us that's our de-stressor. That's the yeah. way that we come out. And that's the way that afterwards we can enjoy the process of, you know, post-processing or anything else like that to get that final yeah. result. Absolutely. And actually, that's just like me because I always say that photography, it's my breathing oxygen because I will not be able to sit with the patients and I'm working full-time also in psychiatry. I'm doing remote appointments in this exact space where I'm talking, obviously I use a shirt, I use my sun, uh, my eyeglasses, I have more of a doctor figure instead of the landscaper figure, but I yeah. usually do a lot of work both in remote appointments and in clinics. And if it weren't for photography, I would probably, I don't know how I would handle it because with COVID, with everything else, people are extremely distressed and I'm getting more and more requests. And this is definitely the breathing oxygen. I need to channel meaning into my works. And what's interesting is that when I was showing you the presentation at the beginning, when I was showing all the publications and everything else, there was this time when all of a sudden photography became, well, it was also a job. I, I can say this. And I tried as hard as possible not to let it contaminate the pleasure of shooting. Because just like you told me, Rune, when you are shooting, you need to feel absolutely relaxed. You need to feel yes. calm. There's sometimes the adrenaline rush of when the light is good, but that's the good adrenaline. It's not yeah. the anxiety adrenaline. So when things started to get intense... And we can go back to the Instagram algorithm battle, the Facebook algorithm battle, the struggle for visibility, um, the multiple projects, the photo tours, everything was starting to become a little bit too intense. And I was feeling a bit too detached from myself and from my images. And once again, the Twitter NFT space has strongly changed that. And that's what's the most fascinating thing for me. And Will Shark has spoken about it quite a lot, about empowerment of creatives, about valuing one-on-one -on -one pieces. It's the possibility that we now have to focus back into creating. And that is extremely important to me because I need to feel free to, to create and publish my images. So uh, I understand you guys, you are on the IT side of things and it's probably just as chaotic as on the else side of things. And when the computer gets broke, I know that doctors can get pretty mad. Uh, never, never. You <laughs> say never. I'm saying that's an understatement. <laughs> that's an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can say that because I got a few few good friends that I um, uh, that are doctors that I that I used to be terrified of, but um, but got to know them a little bit more, and now can you know? Uh, there were real humans on the other side, right? Sometimes. 
No, sometimes. Okay. <laughs> no, I they that. are. I accept yeah, that. they are. They are. <laughs> <laughs> so Jose, uh, so pivoting a bit. So let let's let's go to um, uh, the standing um, among the giants because okay. I you know this is this is the piece that you submitted for. I mean, we looked at a few of them, right? Uh, and this is the piece you submitted for the Arctic Whale um, initiative for for this month. And I, I'm just. I have I have a lot of questions about this piece, um, you know, the shot, because um, one, did you OK, did you climb up here or where is there a road? Uh, let's let's start there and then we'll we'll continue on. OK, <laughs> yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I, I would never climb this. I don't I, I don't even know if it's actually climbable. I don't know if this word English is not my native language. So sorry <laughs> for some some wrong words but this is actually a 110 meter high cliff and it's quite abrupt and steep so fortunately there's a parking space near this spot but it's an extremely bumpy ride the road is filled with huge potholes but there's actually a parking spot i did not have to do long hiking to get here this was an extremely intense day. I had met with a friend, which is also a photographer. His name is Alexander Otto. He hasn't onboarded the NFT space yet. I need to convince him. But I was with my girlfriend. We were on our camper and we met with Alexander and he suggested us going to this place. So we started driving and something happened, which I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about which is you still have about 10 minutes to arrive to the spot, but the yep. light is getting epic. Yep. And you hour. aren't yet there. You have never been there. You don't know how the shooting location exactly looks like. You cannot see it in the Google Maps because there is no connection on that place. The excitement builds up, the adrenaline builds up. But anyway, we just parked the car. There were intense scale winds. This was extremely chaotic, even though this looks like a very serene landscape but we just needed to get everything ready. And the winds were extremely strong. We knew that this was a steep cliff. So this was one of those moments when I could not worry too much about the gear. I just knew which lens I needed to take, what filters I needed to use, because there would be no time. The light was exploding and this golden view you see on the sky, probably 10 to 15 minutes after I made this shot, it was gone. It was still a beautiful landscape because it was a beautiful blue hour, one hour of shooting. But sometimes I need to go to places probably like to 10 times. I have one very quick example here, which is this place in Portugal, which is a beautiful natural landscape. I never saw any rock formation like this, but I needed to visit this place probably 14 to 16 times until I managed to get an image that I thought that would make justice to this place, which uh, is this yeah. one. So for standing among giants, it was the opposite. It's interesting because sometimes we rationalize a lot the photos we take, but this was probably from the first or second photo I took at this place. So there was some instinct that I just needed to capture the light. I didn't think too much about it. I knew which filters I needed to use. So I just put myself near the cliff. It was kind of scary. My girlfriend was mad at me because she hates me to go too near the cliffs, excessively near the cliffs. So um, this was one of the first shots I made at this location. It wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't already pre-selected the ISO the aperture, then I set manual focus, I knew nice. the filters I needed to use, but nice. this was not the process of rationalizing it too much. This was more of a process of, of feeling the landscape and trying to capture it the best I could. Wow, wow. Uh, and uh, man, uh, I mean, what a, what a great shot. Uh, I mean, you kind of you kind of just hit on the point that, that uh, something connected with me a bit there. I, when you have the shot, you have the shot, you know, um, you know I'll be driving and, and, um, there was this, there was this mist coming off of, you know, it was really cold. It was like minus two. And there was this mist coming off of the lake, uh, near here. And, and the sun was just right, you know? And, and I, and I said to my wife, I said, man, I should really stop and take a picture of this, you know? Mm. Uh, and then I, I get around the other side of the lake, 
where where it would actually be a good place to stop. And then it, the mist was completely gone. The lighting yeah. changed and everything. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, I totally get this. But you know, uh, and this is one of the questions that uh, Wellshark had, which is kind of the same question I was going to ask. How, how long does it normally take uh, to get the right shot? Like how many times do you have to to take? I mean, you, you just said, you know, it's kind of bringing back a little bit, but you just said that you, you know, sometimes you'll go to a destination multiple times. Yeah. Uh, but, we, you know, on average, how long does it take uh, to be satisfied with the shot? Sometimes there's the famous serendipity where everything fits perfectly in the right time. But landscape photography, when you want to get it right in just one shot, when you do not want to do composites, it takes a lot of persistence, a lot of discipline, a lot of frustration, sometimes anxiety. We always show the pretty side of landscape photography. But there are plenty of rainy days, windy days, lots of cold, waiting for the light. So I would say that for my published shots, and I like to publish in low quantity and try to have high quality, I would say that for the, the majority of images, I had to visit these places a lot of times until it was right. And if I don't feel that it's right, I need to return there. I need to find better weather conditions. And probably taking Iceland and Portugal as an example, probably only after my fourth or fifth visit to a specific place, I will have the chance to have an image I'm fully satisfied with. And then there are the examples, like I mentioned before, where sometimes I need to pursue a place for 10 years until finally everything clicks into place. So, well, it's part of the thrill. Sometimes it's anxiety inducing, it's frustrating, but when you get the image, it's extremely rewarding and makes it all worth it. And well, there's this sense of feeling connected to everything around you, which I mentioned in the Icelandic islands. You just view the image on the screen and you just know that that moment was totally worth it, all the efforts. Wow. Oh, man, that is that is amazing. That is amazing. Uh, and, and I'm so glad you picked this particular piece because, you know, and all of your other ones that, that you, you had us look at are, are absolutely amazing. I mean, uh, it was really hard to narrow it down. I got to I got to be honest about that. Um, but I, I am really glad that you picked this one. And I, I love the text behind it. And the title is just absolutely fantastic. I mean, Jose, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you guys were actually pretty cool because I don't want it to force you into having a specific image. Usually, most artists suffer from something which is called imposter syndrome. I yes. like to read a lot about it. Yes, I, I even, suffer from it. <laughs> yeah, even me standing on this side, I don't know. If, I don't know if you guys can sense the anxiety and everything else that's going on my inside. But the thing is that. Even having this portfolio, even being a psychiatrist, everything else, imposter syndrome is always there because we we kind of need to express ourselves. We need to share it with the world. We need to make the world feel something. And this usually comes from a place of fragility. So when I'm showing you this, I didn't want it to just tell you, well, this is my best images. You guys just need to accept it. So it was a very democratic process. Yes. You guys were awesome. Okay. We did some votings and this was the final chosen image. And I was extremely happy that everyone liked it because I wanted you guys to be as happy as I was. So I'm glad you selected this one. It was a good oh, process. It was a, fun, it was a fun process. And I, and yeah, I liked the fact that you did stand back a little bit. So um and that and we all we all like we had our favorites like our top threes and then we had our top twos and then we were like all right everyone we got this one this one is it so <laughs> it did turn out really really great and and so uh you know everyone watching um we will be putting this up for sale uh so this will be up for sale tomorrow um so uh, definitely check it out. That'll be on the Whale Store, the Arctic Whale Store on OpenSea. We'll uh, we'll provide links and everything uh, soon. Uh, you know, Jose, it it has been an absolute pleasure, pleasure um, getting to know you. I know we've talked a lot, you know, but this is this is just absolutely amazing, Jose. Thank uh, you so much. It, it's fantastic, and I, I did want to ask before we, you know, we we are we're approaching the hour here, but. 
Uh, I kind of want to take a little bit more time to ask a few more questions, if you don't mind. I, I told you I would take long. I have <laughs> so many stories to tell you. But yeah, I'm totally available. I can stay as long as you guys want. So go ahead and ask me. I'll tell you. We're, so, um, and this this is just a little bit for everybody. Um, we we are going to have some amazing uh, Twitter Spaces on photography soon, and I think we're definitely going to invite you. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but <laughs> <No>. <laughs> there's already enough stress on this side. But okay, you, you can you can challenge me even further. I'll get some be a little bit more like, a little like, bit more <laughs> calm now since you've been through this process. It, it, it will. <laughs> it, it's it will. hurting a little less now. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, so Jose, um, you know, I, I want to get to this this last question from Wellshark because it's um, it's an interesting one. Uh, he he calls it a challenging questions. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> okay, my anxiety is rising again. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> um, so, in, so he says, Instagram photographers versus gallery fine art curated photographers. Uh, what is the difference and who is going to take the lead in the commercial market? Okay, that's a challenging question. I would say that probably the NFT space will allow us for the first time in art history to find a middle ground because we were almost on extreme opposites. And it's interesting because the photography of traditional art galleries was more related with postmodernist art a very different style of photography. Uh, you guys have probably seen extremely talented portraits and landscape photographers and all kinds of other photography in Twitter. And only a small percentage of these managed to reach the traditional circuit gallery because there is extreme curation and there's a, an extremely strong gatekeeping of these circuits. Definitely. So once again, and I already said this once, I think the NFT space is opening up the doors to find a balance. So I'm not saying that now we should turn all popular photographers into popular NFT photographers um, because there should be some curation. And when I say curation, I'm not talking just about an algorithm. I'm talking about bringing back the connection with the meaning of the image, the emotions it triggers on collectors and on viewers, establishing dialogues, bringing something else that complements the image itself. So I think that probably in the future, if we have more people like Whale Shark trying to give some emphasis to the value of landscape photography, street photography, portraits, how it's made, how it's done, the craft behind it, the effort behind it, probably we will be able to continue collecting, uh, connecting with collectors, and probably there will be a space for photography in the traditional art world, which is, will be the NFT art world in the future. So I really hope that we will find a balance between the things. And these spaces are extremely important. The, I heard the past, the first and the second, the impromptu spaces by Will Shark. And like he said on Twitter, it's kind of trying to elevate the discussion, not in terms of elitism, but in terms of focusing on the craft, focusing on beauty, focusing on meaning, and trying to bring the value of photography to the people who have the liquidity to invest in it, which are usually connected to traditional galleries, but now they have the whole Web3 at their uh, disposal, okay? So I think this is the next step. The evolution, yeah. if you will, that's nice. Yeah, yeah absol absolutely, Jose. That That's a fantastic answer. Uh, sorry for throwing that tough question yeah, at you. Yeah, you got you got I don't know if I want to go to the spaces. <laughs> hey, you've already been through some tough questions, so I think you're going to do fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it, it would be a fantastic uh, to have you at this uh, at one of our spaces for sure. Um, I, it's sad because my, my avatar doesn't shake his head uh, up and down, but I during that whole time, I was shaking my head up and down. Okay, you could you could see me kind of moving. Um, <laughs> but, as you uh, might imagine, as a psychiatrist, <laughs> I'm always extremely dependent on the feedback from the other side of the of yep. the emotions of of the face and the emotions. And you guys are not giving me that, but I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to hold it <laughs> as well as I can. Well, so, the, one day. 
the <laughs> other the other thing is um when because so i smile a lot and this whole this whole time i've been smiling so you'll see the avatar smile <laughs> which is great it's, it's great at least the smile the i don't smile see the when i see the smile <laughs> uh it, it's uh yeah it, like i said it's been it's been fantastic i i did have a, another question um and this is more of like uh what's next for jose right um so i know you're you're talk you're in lisbon right yeah and nft uh lisbon is coming up and i, I think yeah. you got something going on maybe you could share with everybody because i yeah I, definitely i'd love to um yeah yeah, there's the non-fungible conference, which is going to happen on April the 4th and the 5th. Actually, I didn't know about this conference and the path through which I discovered it was quite interesting. Portugal is a paradise. Well, Shark discovered it quite recently. And Portugal is also some sort of a crypto paradise, but also a landscape paradise, a people paradise. Everyone is quite nice here. And usually i noticed the last year when i ventured into the nft space that there were a lot of crypto events on portugal in portugal but portuguese artists didn't know about it and this was quite surprising for me and then all of a sudden by mere chance i just was speaking to a collector of mine uh, jean-michel payon from from ledger and i asked him have you ever been to beautiful Lisbon and he told me oh yes I've been there in the past and I'll be there soon and I asked him okay are you going on a business trip or a leisure trip oh no I'm going to the non-fungible conference event I knew nothing about it this was a few months ago and I spoke with a big group we have a chat group with Portuguese artists and we actually set up a big cyber exhibition which is still ongoing in on cyber and no one knew about the event obviously it was still kind of being created. But what was interesting is that Jean-Michel put me in contact with the organization. I mentioned that we would love to be involved, the Portuguese community of artists. It was The organization was extremely warm and receptive. And all of a sudden, something that was supposed to be quite simple. And I just wanted to get some tickets so that we could be present and have some of our art artworks exhibited. All of a sudden, I was also a curator of the non-fungible conference. So <laughs> I got pretty much involved with the organization. It's been a huge pleasure, a lot of work too, but it's great to know that you are going to have a fantastic NFT event here. And all of a sudden I have this non-voluntary role of being kind of a, a speaker, a voice for the Portuguese community, which is a huge honor. And we managed to have a good number of Portuguese artists on display. And there's an incredible panel of speakers you guys just can you can check the website there's all lots you have just in Aversano, you have john lolos all sorts of famous people from from the scene and i'm still hoping for will shark to give a talk there i don't know if that's <laughs> going to be possible i've tried i've done everything i could not that much so that's the story of, of this in event. I can't wait for it to, to arrive. Obviously, as a curator, ethically, I cannot have any image exhibited there, but it's for a good cause. It's because I'm supporting the, the whole community and it has been extremely exciting. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, it is. And what a what a um, honor. And uh, they are really getting a great speaker. So I, I'm so glad that uh, that you're going there. I know a lot of folks that are going. I wish I could go myself. Yeah. Um, one of these days. You, should come. you need to take care of the computers in the hospital. We do. We do. That's for <laughs> sure. Uh, but yeah, we're we're um, we're very excited that you're you're headed there. Um, and yeah, Jose, uh, again, th this has been a fantastic, uh, talk. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm really so glad that, uh, that we had you on. Um, and yeah, so, so this is a great spot. Um, where can people find out about Jose? <laughs> okay. That's, that's also, that's a non-challenging, but good question. Finally, a non-challenging question. You can go to my Twitter profile. Uh, it's right here, Jose underscore Ramos. We have my link tree where I gather all the links for, for my, my pieces, my NFT pieces. I have my Genesis on Super Rare, which is probably my favorite piece ever. It was in Iceland. It was one of those moments where I needed to visit the place a lot 
a, a huge number of times till I got the image right. I needed to be inside the water, the freezing water to do this. Um, I also have my foundation page. I have the image with the sunflowers near my city. Just like I told you, this is 100% profits to Ukraine. I was extremely happy when I saw that I had a bid and then I already got two more bids. It's going to be fully donated. And because Ukraine also has this kind of landscapes, it was quite symbolical of it. I have my maker's place, yes, page two. In maker's place, I mostly um, focused in Portugal. I have some of my, I would say, classical peer images of a very special place in Portugal, uh, which is a dream for long exposure photography, which is an ancient Palafit pier building where you can do the most incredible transformations of chaos into serenity, just like I mentioned before. And then I also have my Genesis collection on, on OpenSea, um, which was my first uh, published project in the NFT space. It's the only collection I've ever made. I would only do a collection if it were really a collection with a common theme. And it was quite a challenge, but it was my, my, my first uh, entrance into the NFT mind space. Um, so probably the link tree is the best place to, to find all these links. Real quick, Jose, I did want to congratulate you one on the uh, bids and the sales on that, um, on that sunflower piece. It's amazing. And all for what you're doing it for, um, because that is obviously um, a really, uh, really, really uh, tough situation that's going on over there. Um, but thank you for doing that. I'll just say that for myself. Yeah, just like I said on Twitter, it's just a tiny grain of sand. But I think that if all of us do do something, it makes a difference. And once again, the empowerment of the NFT space was incredible. It was it, this would never happen on Instagram, but all the gathering towards the cause of Ukraine. The I found myself starting to be a collector. Uh, I collected pieces from Ukrainian artists like this one and this one. I spoke directly with them. They were right in Ukraine. Amazing. This made a huge difference for them. I yeah. also collected another piece which was made by a Portuguese artist, but with all the profits to Ukraine. And yep. seeing all the movements towards helping this country, which yeah. is needing help so much, well, it would not happen in any other space yeah. uh, other than the NFT space. And this is a, and it's amazing how, how technology has given us this opportunity to be able to for, uh, you know, even, you know, us, uh, us regular folks, you know, to be able to help in whatever way we can and what we couldn't yeah. have done in the past. Definitely. A absolutely. Absolutely. Well, again, Jose, fantastic. I am so happy. You know, folks, uh, I did post this, your links in our discord and I will show, or I will share the, uh, the links for uh, your, your works and your link tree okay. uh, soon. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, and and folks, um, please check out the uh, the wonderful piece going on the whale store. We'll have that up very shortly. Um, I know that there is quite the interest in it. Fights. There's going to be some fights for this piece. There is going to be some I fights. Hope so really good fight. Hope. Not bad fight. Good <laughs> fight. Good, fight. good, good fights. fights. Good fights. And with that, again, Jose uh, Rune, thank you both for uh, for coming on. Uh, Jose, uh, it's been fantastic, a pleasure. Um, again. You great to great to meet you or kind of talk over you know voice uh you know we've been talking like I said for a while finally <laughs> yeah. um so yeah uh again pleasures all ours and with that i am going to take us out with this wonderful video that uh, was made by cartoon advisory all right well thanks everybody thank you so much everyone thank you <laughs>